Welcome to the Walled Culture Podcast, where we take a look at and beyond the copyright bricks creating the walls that block digital access to content and to innovation. I'm Carla Nillington, and our Walled Culture guest today is Mike Masnick, the founder of well-known technology, policy, law, and issues blog, TechDirt, which has shaped many important discussions around copyright and digital technologies for more than two decades. Mike is also the founder of the Copia Institute, a Silicon Valley-based think tank focused on research at the always interesting intersection of technology, innovation, and policy. Welcome, Mike. Thanks for having me. Um, You've been an articulate and passionate contributor to major conversations and dare I say, major arguments around technology and copyright from very early on. TechDirt, for example, was founded in 1997, which is that interesting point where the public internet was beginning to take off, and many of these issues were beginning to emerge. And I think it's important to say the issues back then and now, were not always foreseeable or easily understood or accepted by the people, even the people most affected by them. And so I thought a good place to start would be to ask you what motivated TechDirt's creation and your strong interest in copyright. And I'm guessing there's probably a bit of overlap between both of those things. (laughs) Um, Yeah, there is. I mean... um... Uh, this, where, 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 how, how do I tell this story? Um, I, I mean, I was, um, at the time I was actually in business school, um, and I was very interested in innovation and entrepreneurship and the internet in particular, because it seemed like, um, a, a really interesting opportunity, uh, that there were going to be a lot of very interesting things coming out of the internet, um, and so I was starting to explore those. And, and one of the things that I learned early on, and this is in the sort of 95, 1995, 1996 timeframe, was that copyright policy was actually a big part of that in, in terms of what it was going to allow on the internet and what it was not going to allow on the internet. Um, and so I became very interested early on, really what, start, what it started as is, is kind of the economics of information and, and how information could flow. Um, and one of the things that you learn, especially in that time frame, uh, of how does information flow and how, how can things be built around the flow of information was that copyright was, was a huge issue related to that in terms of setting up some barriers that I thought didn't really make very much sense and, and pot- potentially distorting certain markets in, in ways that, that um, I think at an instinctual level, a lot of people felt didn't make much sense. Um, and so, you know, when I started to write about things and, 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 you know, TechDirt was kind of my place to explore these ideas and how internet related entrepreneurship could grow and what kinds of innovation we would see. Um, copyright was definitely a huge part of that focus because I was trying to think through what, what business models were possible. Um, and many of the interesting ones that I saw, I thought were being hindered and blocked by, traditional copyright policy. Okay. And you're, um, as uh, TechDirt developed, you've, you've become particularly well known for developing a deep discussion on that site around the economics of copyright in the context of digital technologies. And an, a very interesting one, which sets the idea of abundance against that of scarcity, which is a traditional economics concept, of course, for anyone who did economics 101 in, or 1A in, <laughs> in, in university. But you place them into how digital technologies may or should change our understanding and application of them, and and also change the business models that they offer or even demand. And you focused on working through a lot of these ideas over a series of TechDirt posts in 2006 and 2007, which of course have gone on to inspire your book, Approaching Infinity, if anyone wants to dive into that at a deeper level. But can you explain what you mean when you talk about abundance and scarcity in a digital world? And how I love how Thomas Jefferson figures in all of this, which may be a name that might surprise many in a 21st century context who don't know too much about copyright um, law and sort of where we began, and also what it means for copyright and business models. Yeah. Well, there's a yeah, lot there. Yeah, there's a lot. So, so, in, so in, in the next three uh, hours, please go into all of that. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I mean, so just to go back, I mean, to, to the Thomas Jefferson uh, point, and I'll just raise this quickly because, you know, Jefferson obviously, you know, was a, a key founder of, of, you know, founding father of, of the U.S. And, and was very involved in, um, you know, obviously the Declaration of Independence um, had less involvement in the, in the Constitution, but then was um, also the, um, the, the first uh person who ran the patent office in the US. Um, and there are some differences between copyright and patent, obviously. But later on, he had written a letter um, responding to someone who had, who had asked him a, a bunch of questions. And and uh, I don't have the, the phraseology that the sort of brilliant uh, phrasing of Thomas Jefferson at the tip of my tongue, but, but talked about this idea of um, ideas being this sort of unique concept, unlike you know, physical limited products that uh, he compared it to a, to a flame, to a fire, that if I have a, a flame and light yours, we both have flame, you know, it, it doesn't go away. And this is, you know, he wrote this in the, in the early 1800s um, and it was really quite, you know, quite ahead of its time in terms of kind of uh, people trying to understand economics. Um, and so, where the economics flows into this is that traditionally a lot of people refer to economics itself as like the, the study of uh, resource allocation in the presence of scarcity. And, and for most of its history, that has been the case that, that people are talking about when they're talking about resource allocation, you're talking about physical goods. You have so many widgets or blocks and you have to figure out how, how do you distribute them? And that's often, you know, using a mechanism of, of price, uh, and and uh, supply and demand curve to, to figure out you know how many do you produce uh, where does it go things like that um, information though is, is different because information is not a scarce good in that if I have it you can't have it um, and it is sort of infinitely re uh, um, replicable um, and and that creates a, a different world one that is not about scarcity and and where the distribution um, of the, the concepts is not held to the same rules that, that something in a, in a scarce world is. Um, and so it goes back to that, that concept of Thomas Jefferson and talking about, about fire um, and how you can share that. And it's, it's an idea that can spread and everyone can, can have their, you know, their candles lit or whatever the, the terminology is without it costing uh, anyone. No one loses something um, in the, in the process. And so, that is when you begin to think about it, the way that ideas flow, you know, I can share an idea with you. We can share ideas with the world. Thanks to, you know, podcasts and, and, and the internet. Um, and you know, each person listening to it is not, is not costing anymore. You know, there, there are perhaps negligible arguments about like the cost of bandwidth, um, that, that, that can, can, get involved here. But, but generally speaking, the idea, I can pass an idea onto you, you can pass it on to other people and we still have the ideas. Um, and the, the sort of curious nature of that is, is that that actually leads to innovation and economic growth. And there's a whole field of economics and I don't know how deep we want to go on this, but there's a whole field of econo economics around sometimes called like new growth theory, um, which is all based on this idea that the, the, the fundamental mechanism of economic growth is simply ideas. And the reason that works is because of what I was just talking about, which is that it creates something new out of nothing, right? right? You know, I can pass an idea onto you. You can take that idea and do more with it. You can add your own perspectives and your own ideas um, and you can pass those on and other people can have them and, and you're not losing anything and everybody can build on it. So the, the fundamental ingredient of economic growth is this ability of ideas to flow freely and for people to, to improve on them. And that's what creates more out of the same amount of physical stuff. The ideas themselves uh, enable that, that growth. And so, you know, that was the, the underlying sort of economic thought process behind all this. And, and when I looked at the way that copyright played into this, you know, copyright's fundamental mechanism is trying to stop the sharing of information. And in that way, it is trying to effectively hold back the, this entire concept, hold back this mechanism, this ingredient of economic growth uh, by, by limiting that. Um, and, and I found that to be problematic for, for whatever 
benefits there are there may be of of a copyright system that is designed to to incentivize the creation of works the fact that it fundamentally holds back the sharing of ideas um, was you know struck me as, as a huge problem both in terms of just the the general concept of being able to share ideas with one another and then economically speaking as a as a um, you know engine of growth is, does copyright have a, a place at all in in your train of thought or is it something which should be more limited than what it's turned into because there Jefferson I think was arguing for a certain amount of time that an idea would be protected am I correct in that and then it would be so, released so, for further development because otherwise it would just ideas or creation stag <laughs> begin to stagnate because somebody can't further build on the great idea that's already there or the great concept product whatever yeah, I, I think there, there, um, there, there certainly probably is a place for copyright. I, I think um, what it is and how it how it should look is a big open question, and I, I think it's one that that should be explored and should be tested empirically. Um, to date, that's not really the way it's done. It, 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 copyright policy has really been sort of driven by you know some special interests and and certainly an awful lot of emotion. Um, but yes, it, it, to get to the point of early copyright law. Um, and in fact, you know, written into the the U.S. Constitution is this idea that um, copyright. Two things about copyright: one is that it is uh, for the benefit of the public, um, uh, not for the benefit of the the creators. Mm -hmm. it, it was designed for the benefit of the to promote the progress of of um, of, of arts and sciences, um, and that is for a limited time. Uh, and and both of those were really important qualities of of copyright in the in the U.S. context, at least, that have mostly been ignored <laughs> uh, since then, especially really in the last fifty years. Um, the idea being that you know the purpose is to you know, the purpose of copyright itself is to create the incentive so that someone will create something, mm -hmm. and that 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 something that they create then goes to the public who can then make use of it. Now, the incentive structure of copyright initially is that that the creator um, or the holder of the copyright, who is often not the creator, um, gets exclusivity for a limited period of time that is written into the Constitution that is supposed to be limited. And when copyright was first, the first copyright law of 1790 in the U.S. limited copyright to 14 years. Uh, and then you could get an extension for a second 14 years. So there was a maximum of 28 years, at which point anything would then be in the public domain. It was also limited only to works that were registered. It was limited to a very small classification of books, charts, maps, and one other item I'm forgetting suddenly, sorry. But there were four items that were covered. Um, and everything else was not. And that is a completely different world than the copyright that we have today, which everything creative is basically automatically copyrighted. And then it is your life plus another 70 years in the US and, and slightly different terms elsewhere. Um, that is very, very different than a very limited set of things that you have to register with the copyright and mm -hmm. at maximum could only be for 28 years. So we're living in a very, very different world. And, and in fact, in this world, works that I create, for example, um, will not go into the public domain in my lifetime unless I dedicate it to the public domain, which I try to do with as much of my work as possible. But um, even that is is sort of a misnomer. Uh, you, because of the structure of copyright law today, you can't technically put something in the, the public domain. All I can do is effectively waive my right to use the copyright uh, against someone, which is sort of a, a technical distinction, but one that, that actually does kind of matter. So to, to get back to the, to the, the point that you, that you, the question that you actually asked, you know, I do think that there, there are probably some very interesting elements of copyright as a tool to incentivize certain classes of works. Um, and I would love to, if we could explore, you know, n not we as in you and I, but like, you know, the world could explore this idea of, you know, what classes of work really need that kind of incentive and what is the optimal setup of that incentive in order to, to um, you know, to, to justify the creation of those works so that the public itself can actually get access to as much work as possible to then, to then do more with them. Talk a bit about the economics of free as well, with this idea of increasing the value of scarce components um, by setting free 
the infinite components and 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 maybe you can talk about that a little in because that moves us a bit more towards business models and some of what's been happening um, sure. since the start of the internet the music industry for example and and what where is the opportunity with scarcity and and what becomes um, abundance at that point so you know so th- <laughs> there's because you you really have some quite interesting ideas about how these things play together and we've seen some of the we're still fighting over this now in national governments in industry organizations and individual creators so um, can you lay out that stall um, yeah absolutely so so you know it's interesting um, some of this discussion sort of came about because when when I wrote those posts, which is now you know fifteen sixteen years ago, um, a lot of the discussion was really about kind of the the early generation of of what's referred to as piracy, um, and um, you know in particular the music industry sort of kept going on this this rant about how you know piracy devalued the music and and if um, you know if music was allowed. Um, you know, if it was it, if it became common that music was shared through the internet for free, um, that nobody would create any music anymore. There would be no incentive to create more music, um, uh, and and that it would it would completely destroy the value of the business. Um, and I was looking at that and said, I don't think that's accurate. I don't think that's true. Um, and so there are a few different components to that. There, one is that you know when talking about this this abundance and scarcity concept. Um, you know, what I realized is that abundance often creates new kinds of scarcity uh, and business models play at that intersection of scarcity and abundance. So let me explain a little bit because that it, it might help to unpack that. <laughs> um, you know, um, the, the, uh, the points that people are willing to pay for, the points that people are really comfortable paying for it tend to be the things that are scarce, right? If something is abundant, they're, you know, the idea of paying for something that is abundant feels instinctually problematic and instinctually troublesome. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, if something is so abundant, and, and I refer to it as like infinite goods, if something is so infinitely available, um, then why should there be any price? You know, again, like the flame, if, if, if you can, you can hand it off to me for free, you don't lose anything. I get the flame. I can do whatever I want with it. I can pass it on to other people. Other people can pass it on. Um, there's no cost associated. There's no loss associated and therefore paying for it feels instinctually problematic, but with every bit of abundance or with every kind of infinite good, there is a creation of other kinds of scarcity and that scarcity is where there can be interesting business models. And so part of my argument, and I and I still very much believe this, is that as you create more information flows and as you create more infinite goods, there are other kinds of scarcities that come up that create opportunities for business models. Now, the, the most obvious okay, one I'm and the one that has there, made some companies and some individuals extraordinarily rich in the, in the interim uh, is attention. Uh, attention is a scarce uh, is a scarcity and the overflow and the abundance of information that is out there has created a kind of market for attention historically that has generally been in in the form of advertising and so you have all these these giant internet companies now that have sort of taken advantage of that market for attention and the free information that's out there and and built this this huge you know very very profitable market for attention in terms of selling advertisements uh you know for that that try and try and get your attention um, but i think there are a lot of other ways in which that also becomes true and we are seeing that you know in the the music business as well you know, which is where a lot of this thinking came from originally. Like nowadays, it is really, really popular and makes a ton of sense for artists to release their music and make it as widely available as possible to get attention. People are putting their own music on YouTube, uh, Spotify, all these other platforms. And, and you know, some of them do pay uh, directly. There is some sort of licensing in, in, involved in that. But, you know, oftentimes the licensing is between the platform and, and the 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 copyright holder or the musician, depending on, or perhaps maybe the same, may not be the same, um, because they realize that the more that, that they get attention, um, 
for their music and the bigger of a following they can have, they can start to apply all different kinds of interesting business models to that, you know, and some of the, the really interesting ones, um, you know, are things like Patreon. And I think Patreon is a really interesting example because it was founded by a musician who became famous by posting really amazing videos to, to YouTube um, and just, you know, built this huge following on YouTube. Um, he made some money from YouTube because, you know, you could put ads on, on the videos, but he was saying, you know, not, not in a sustainable way, but decided to set up this system called Patreon, which is that he knew he had built up these fans and he had had, had a huge, you know, close connection with his fans. Um, and the initial setup Patreon has, has changed somewhat in how it's set up, but the original version of it, which I still think was, was quite brilliant, um, is this idea that the fans would sign up and say, every time you release a song, I agree to pay you a dollar or $5 or whatever it was. And, and you would get different benefits for that, different scarce benefits. And those could be access to, to the musician, access to Jack, who's the founder, of, uh, Jack Conti, who's the founder of Patreon. Um, or it could, it could be other things. It could be, you know, access to secret, you know, you know, hidden material, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the original, version of the song like you know a, a test version but it was basically the system that said you know you've built up this fan base the fan base wants to support you and the fan base is saying ahead of time every time you release a new song we will pay you this amount and then the the musician themselves knows that every time they release a new song they're going to get a, a, you know whatever the, the chunk of money is, and they, they might know, like, you know, every time I release a song, I am automatically going to get $6,000 or whatever it is, you know, however much support they get. Um, and therefore they have incentive to create. And it doesn't matter whether or not the, the song is then available for free or if it's locked up and, and you have to pay it for it. In fact, it's better for the song to be available for free because then more people hear it, more people are interested in the musician, more people learn about the Patreon, more people are willing to support it. And so you build up this sort of flywheel of, of, support so that you do have a business model it's not devalued the music at all but you can you can do more with it and you can have people you can have your own fans share the music freely with other people to build a larger audience and to do more you know and 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 you know beyond patreon you have other things you know you know pre-pandemic i guess it's coming back now but you could do shows and and you, you know uh artists would make money with shows merchandise has always been a big part of of uh you know doing music there are a whole bunch of different interesting business models that that have been d discovered and have been used and very few of them actually really rely on copyright you know many of them will use copyright kind of as a backstop in some ways and because the copyright system is here they don't ignore it um but it's really amazing how many of the newer business models around around content really don't directly rely on copyright. And you could see a world in which if there were no copyright, many of those business models really would still work. And in fact, you know, they might even work better because people would be more willing to sort of share the content to build a bigger audience that then sort of builds into that flywheel supporting those artists. And I think it's important to say as well, you've emphasized many times you're not pro-piracy, you're pro producer in that none of this is to say that somebody doesn't have a, a right to defend against piracy as opposed to offering their product to their creation for free or at a nom or in some sort of nominal way of accessing it it might be selling it through their patreon but um because i know that's been a, a probably one of the more um consistent complaints and it's certainly and it's important too because it's it's the key point made by the industries around the creators and to especially to persuade small creators that somehow this is all an issue of piracy and that there are no other options except long terms of copyright. Yeah, and and I think that is important, and and I've I've, I've spoken out against like I, I don't think piracy is a good thing. I don't support it. I don't participate in it. Um, and and uh, you know I think that you know my you know everything that I'm writing and everything I'm talking about is more for the the creators themselves, and I'm hoping that they understand that there are more benefits than 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 simply assuming that copyright is the only method for them to have a business model. And in fact, you know part of that part of that is that you know when you look at how the the industries around copyright have developed they have often been very anti creator you know these are it, it often turns out to be very large industry uh, organizations that um, you know 
effectively exploit the actual content creators by saying, you know, in order to have a business, you need a copyright. And the only way to do that is to work with us. So if you're a record label, you sign over your copyright to the record label and they sign you to like, you know, effectively indentured <laughs> servitude type of contracts. Yeah, we know, we know where, how well you know, that's worked out over advance, decades the, of, uh, <laughs> of in, industry activity. It's yes. how many pr- biographies of, uh, of, of famous people in music exactly. focus on precisely this problem as well. Um, and and right, I mean, yeah, no, so sorry. no, I was just going to so maybe a, that's maybe a good a good um, point at which to note that twenty twenty two is also a, a major copyright or anti copyright anniversary and and one that Tech Dirt um, marked with a series of really interesting contributor pro- posts earlier this year. It's the tenth anniversary of the successful twenty twelve global public campaign against two big copyright proposals in the U.S. um, that became known as SOPA and PIPA, SOPA, the Stop Online Piracy Act, and then then the sidekick PIPA, the Protect IP Act. And both you and Tector generally are widely credited with having advanced the public awareness about these two, what were two initially really obscure acts on topics that aren't an obvious public draw either. And both acts also had um, really daunting political support, cross-party political support in the U.S. and support from so many organizations and businesses, unions, institutions. Um, I wonder, how, how did the, were they immediately on your right radar? And then what happened next? How did you start to um, um, advocate in this area <laughs> and agitate maybe is a better way, a better term? Yeah. I mean, so, you know, it was interesting. Um, you know, th- there had been this sort of almost clockwork like e- uh, expansion of copyright law. And, and I think at one point during the, the SOPA PIPA fight, I had gone back and looked and, and I don't remember the exact numbers. I believe in the previous 25 years, there had been something like 12 different copyright laws passed that were all expansions of copyright in, in some form or another, some some in small ways, some in big ways. But effectively, every two years, there was some sort of expansion of the power of copyright holders over the power of the public uh, and the rights of the public. Um, and, and that was concerning. And so, you know, I'd certainly been following different different um, proposals and different suggestions. Um, and the timing of SOPA PIPA, um, there was one bill that actually came out uh, a year earlier in the in the previous congressional session, which was COICA, and I don't remember what it stood for, C O I C A, mm-hmm. um, but it was it was the the same kind of bill that was basically. Um, so this all came out in in the wake of a number of different important court cases. Uh, around copyright cases that went to the Supreme Court, um, there was the the Grokster case was probably the biggest one, which did involve, um, you know, there were issues of piracy, but there was a, a very real and important question that I think the court did not fully understand, um, which was, you know, whether or not the software maker, the company that makes the software, should be held liable for the actions of their users. So if if the users are using the technology for piracy, who is legally responsible for that? Who should be? You know, I, I, I think that if people are directly infringing on the copyright, th- there's a perfectly good argument that they are liable for that for that infringement. But the, the real question was, could the software be liable for that? Um, and, and the court did say yes. Uh, and, and that sort of changed some of the market for where and how piracy was occurring on the internet. Um, and it moved from sort of soft, from software to, to websites. Uh, and that sort of freaked out the industry and they said, we need to do something. And the only thing that they could think of was basically like, give us the ability to completely shut down and block off websites, even if those websites have plenty of perfectly you know, First Amendment protected speech on them. We need to be able to take those websites down. And so that to me represents a huge, huge problem for a variety of reasons. Um, You know, certainly just general free speech principles, right? I mean, taking down a website is effectively the same to me as smashing a printing press. And 
since the beginning of the United States, we sort of recognize that the First Amendment prevents, you know, the government from coming in and smashing a printing press or telling somebody else that they have the right to smash somebody's printing press because they don't like what's there. Um, and yet that's what these bills effectively were doing. Um, there was a, a secondary but still deeply important concern, which was just basic understanding of the technology behind how the internet mm -hmm. works and how security on the internet works. And some of that involves being able to access certain websites in, in important ways. And the structure of these bills would effectively break that. And there was a, a, a specific uh, security standard that was being worked on that would break uh, if this law went into effect. And it because basically, you know, w when you send out information on the internet trying to reach a certain website, it is supposed to send back certain messages. And the way the law was structured, it would not send back those messages, effectively breaking the entire setup that lots of people and lots of security systems completely relied on. So you had these two very, very big concerns uh, around those bills. Um, and the fact that they were, you know, they had this tremendous momentum, as you said, I mean, basically, you know, more than half of Congress supported these bills, you know, in, in on both parties, it was, you know, were, were had signed on to it because it to them, it seemed like a, a no brainer. You know, again, every two years they were doing something to sort of help out their their friends in, in the copyright industries. And so they just, you know, we're just going to sort of plow forward with this. Um, and it struck me and, and many others, I certainly was not the only one, but it's, it struck us as, as hugely problematic that this kind of thing was going to skate through and nobody was willing to discuss or even think through the implications of it on, on speech, on the ability to create websites, on the ability to talk about things, um, uh, and on the ability for there to be a secure internet. And so all of those contributed to us sort of, you know, raising the alarm and, and lots of other people too, um, and eventually to the to those bills not, not being able to Which pass. Which was an, an extraordinary coalition of different groups, sort of unlikely bedfellows as well, which often seems to be yes. what it takes to defeat these things. I mean, I can remember at the time doubting that this was going to be halted at all. I know um, it's that you have expressed, at the time you expressed your, um, you've said you had your doubts on this plan to black out websites as well and would yeah. would any significant number of, of organization companies and individuals take up that particular aspect of the campaign but in the end it was over a hundred thousand websites and certainly I mean everybody it made everybody aware of that on the day because it was really big companies everything from big companies down to small website owners and bulletin board owners etc yeah and 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 I think it's, there's a couple of points there that are kind of important to discuss, which is like, I, I was skeptical. I mean, there was this sort of interesting and, and really helpful, I mean, you sort of talked about this very diverse coalition in lots of different ways. Um, but one of the elements of that, that coalition that I thought was really interesting was you had a bunch of people who had been through, you know, decades of copyright fights. Um, in some cases, many decades of copyright fights, uh, and and always lost. You know, always on on behalf of of the public and the end user, and always lost. I mean, absolutely every time. There were no wins for the public in the copyright space. You know, uh, prior to this, I mean, you could go back mm -hmm. decades. It was all in one direction, a ratchet that just helped the industry. Um, and so those people came in and said, we have to fight because we always fight, but we are going to lose. And then part of the coalition were a bunch of sort of, you know, young, I, I still would say naive, you know, internet savvy people, you know, digitally native people who were like, this is crazy. This can't be allowed to happen. This can't happen. And so they came in with a lot of energy and enthusiasm and this, you know, belief that of course we'll win because we have to win. Mm. Uh, and, and, you know, you have this sort of like old cynical crew, which I guess I sort of was probably a part of saying like, you know, we'll fight and make a lot of noise and then we'll lose. Right. Because that's what we always yeah. do. Um, and yet, you know, you had these, these, these really, you know, the, these people who believed. And, and so like my issue with the, with the blackout when it was first suggested was like, I thought, you know, look, we're going to get like 15 sites. <laughs> They're going to make a little bit of noise and, and it's going to be embarrassing that that so few sites took part and that nobody cared. And then, you know, Congress is going to be like, ha ha, look at these guys. Uh, they can't do anything. Nobody really supports them. And and it's going to fail. Uh, and I was completely wrong on that. <laughs> you know? Which I'm sure is. Uh, but, we but I do want to know you, one. I'm sure you really welcome the fact oh, that you were wrong. Yes, I, I was. <laughs> couldn't be happier very to, happy be to be proven wrong. But, wrong. I felt the same way. I didn't. I thought it'll be 10 websites or 15. And then suddenly everything right. was blacked out. It was amazing. 
but 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 I do want to add one thing to that, which I think is important because a lot of people at the time and and certainly afterwards in, insisted that much of this was actually driven by by the by the larger internet players and Google in particular is, is often the company that was blamed for this because Google did they didn't black out but they did put a message on their site telling people um, you know that they to to uh, you know to call call their congressman and 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 whatever else. Um, you know, and they were very much a late, late addition to this. You know, people had been yelling at Google for months saying that this is serious, this will impact everything, um, and you need to get on board and you need to say something. And and Google had, uh, you know, did not appear to be interested until very, very late in the process to actually speak up and do something about it. And so the the idea, you know, I think it's really important to to reemphasize how much of this was really driven by you know you know people who were not at all connected to to the larger companies and and we helped sort of drag those companies kicking and screaming into this process and and that did help you know certainly on the day having Google and having Wikipedia uh, and Tumblr and which was big back then no longer is but like you know having having some of these bigger websites. Uh, participate was, was certainly instrumental to it, but they were not the ones who drove it. It was it was the activists who really drove it and, and got those companies involved. And which and a good follow up to that then is to say, what did that win mean, and has it influenced the success or not of further copyright campaigns in the U.S. or the EU or elsewhere? And uh, you know, I was thinking about the EU's upload filters campaign to give just one example. I wonder, and have those coalitions been able to come together? since uh so so you just you just froze for much of that question oh, so i didn't actually okay hear sorry i know it. i'm you repeat I, it sorry yeah i said so what did that mean uh, what did that win mean then and did it influence the success or not of further copyright campaigns in the u.s or the eu or elsewhere um I I think the win was important, but in some ways uh, limited. Um, it it certainly got attention, and certainly, um, you know, on the on the U.S. congressional side, it certainly scared them away from from doing anything else for a while. Um, though they're back now, uh, trying trying things again. Um, but but really, there was a sort of you know almost ten year reprieve. Uh, where Congress, after having done a, a bunch of really bad policies for a long time, sort of pushed and left copyright aside. Um, I think elsewhere um, around the globe, it had an impact as well. There were certainly other global policies um, that, um, you know, that I think were probably held back because of the success of the fight against SOPA. Um, again, that started to fade away. I think I think there was a limited period of time in which the the SOPA effect. Um, kept bad policies at bay. Um, you know, I think that the industries have sort of regrouped and figured out new ways and, and new tactics to, to go after it. And we've seen certainly like the EU copyright directive, um, though, you know, I'd argue to some extent that, um, you know, the EU copyright directive is as problematic as I think parts of it were. Um, I think if without SOPA, um, it would have been much, much worse and, 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 and much more troubling. And I think that, um, you know, the results of what happened with SOPA have, have limited that possibility. I think also the fight over SOPA has made many both, uh, on the policymaking side and within the industry recognize that there are some limits to how far they can go. Um, and, and certainly, you know, one example of that is in the U S for, for, for many, many decades, we kept getting copyright term extension where every time certain works were about to go into the public domain, there would be this scramble to extend copy the copyright term for mm-hmm. another 20 years or whatever. Um, and so in the U S for example, we had, you know, a, approximately 20 years or more than that, actually, almost 30 years, I think, where nothing went into the public domain. Um, you know, everywhere else in the world on January 1st, lots of works would go in the public domain. In the U.S., we had nothing go in for many decades. That finally changed like five years ago. Um, and that has been a huge win, I think, in the U.S. And, and there's been no indication that the industry is ever going to try for for further copyright extension. Um, and so I think, you know, there are some elements of, of what happened with the SOPA fight that have made people realize um, that they can't just keep extending copyright to, to ridiculous lengths. Um, but 
you know, there are limits to that. And we've seen that with a bunch of copyright proposals now where people are trying to take a different, a different stance and trying to come up with ways to, to approach copyright. And, you know, I would say related issues around sort of internet freedom of speech, mm -hmm. um, through kind of a, a different angle, some of which have actually been somewhat successful. Yeah, well, that's a perfect um, a point for me to ask you about your 2019 essay um, for the Free Speech Future, Free Speech Futures series. You wouldn't want to say that fast several times <laughs> um, from the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University. Um, and it's entitled Protocols, Not Platforms, A Technological Approach to Free Speech. And even though this is slightly to the side of um, the issue of copyright, I wondered, could you give us a, a an overview of what you argued for there, maybe quick a quick overview on. I know it's another huge topic that I'm, um, <laughs> with, which, which we don't have hours to explore, but um, I'm also wondering um, if there's an angle to such a structuring that you argue for in this essay that might benefit copyright issues as well. Yeah. So the thinking behind the, the protocols, not platforms paper was, you know, this recognition that certainly there was, there was a lot of growing concern in a few different ways. And part of it was just sort of like the, the growing power of a few giant internet companies um, and sort of their ability to, to, you know, sort of affect the discourse in, in some way or another. Um, and, and some of that included concerns about um, one, uh, moderating speech, taking down speech or shutting down accounts that, that some people felt shouldn't be shut down. And then on the flip side, not shutting down speech that other people felt should be, should be shut down. So it's sort of the, the content moderation debate that, that was a big deal. Um, and, and a, a legitimate one for concern. And, and there were, the, the realization was that there are trade-offs to every approach, but in, in thinking through it, there was this recognition that, um, you know, thinking back to kind of the origins of the internet and what made the internet so powerful and so successful and so empowering um, in, in the in the early days, it was that it pushed the power of the network to the ends, that users could set up their own websites, users could set up their own servers, users could set up their own uh, systems themselves, and they had power over it, and then you could communicate with others. Um, and that had changed in sort of the early to mid 2000s um and, and that you know you were you were suddenly reliant on just a few companies for almost every every service that you were using online and that was a very different world and i thought you know likely contributed to a number of the problems that people were attributing to social media or to to other aspects of the internet and so i wanted to see could we envision how do we take what happened in the the early days of the internet where it was really sort of control and power was pushed to the ends of the network um and and you know in a much more distributed way with what we had learned of you know what a successful global internet scale project looks like and, and can we take those two things and kind of you know revisit the earlier version where it was more distributed and more more controlled the ends and so i began to argue you know and 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 sort of the easiest way to think about this, if people are not you know deep in the weeds on it, is to think about email because email is built on a series of different protocols, um, and anybody can implement their own email system. And so some people have email from their employer, some people have email from their ISP, some people use different web services. Obviously, Google has Gmail is kind of the 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 ones that that lots and lots of people use probably the most. Um, but, you know, Microsoft has their own. Yahoo still has email. Um, there are privacy uh, focused email servers. There, are, there There's all different things. But one of the things about it is that you don't, you can you can communicate with anyone else with any email address. You are not just limited. If you're on Gmail, you can't just communicate with Gmail users. You can communicate with anyone. Um, and if you decide that you no longer trust Google with your email, you can move to to another provider. There are some switching costs, but they're not they're not too too bad. You can extract all of your emails. You can move them into a different system. You can extract your uh, address book, and you can continue to email people. You have to update them on on your email address, but that's not that complicated. Um, 
And so, you know, if you decide that you don't trust the company or if the company for whatever reason kicks you off, um, you don't lose the ability to email or the ability to communicate with other people. And so I started to think about, you know, could, could we build a similar kind of system like that for other tools such as social media? And it seems to make a lot of sense in ways that could potentially solve a lot of problems um, in that you, again, sort of put put the control to the edges. You could still have, as we have with Gmail and Google, frankly, you could still have you know, large players who are, who are, you know, the, the sort of major ones that lots of people use because of the, the ease of use, because of maybe some of the security aspects that they put in there. Um, but, you know, you still have options and those options actually matter. And, and I think, you know, there's a, a strong argument that Gmail, you know, Google has, has been, you know, less evil <laughs> with Gmail uh, because they know that. Because they recognize that, um, you know, in the early days, Google Gmail did include advertisements, but they they since moved away from that in part because they were getting attacked for for the fact that they had advertisements with with uh, Gmail that would scan your messages and that felt uncomfortable to people, um, and so the company backed away from that. I don't know that they would have done that if if there wasn't this ease of of switching to another provider that you trusted more, um, or if there was the kind of lock in that we see with with social media, um, and so you know. I think it works as a system to um, to protect, you know, protect individuals, protect their ability to speak freely, but also allow for different and competing and perhaps innovative approaches to questions around content moderation. Um, so, you know, in an ideal world, you would see something like, you know, anyone can can select their social media platform of choice and you can communicate with others. But if you are an abusive user, if you're spamming, if you're harassing, if you are, you know, sending death threats, I I don't know. I mean, there are all different kinds of of, of abuse that happens. Um, You know, different things can happen where the end users could cut you off. So, you know, if you're, if you're causing a problem, I could, I could cut you off. So I never have to hear from you again. Um, or, you know, the platform that I'm using could choose to cut you off. So if I am using the Twitter implementation of this, um, and Twitter decides that it does not want to allow this kind of abusive user on their platform, they could cut you off. You know, you could still have your, you could still make noise and, you know, it might be to an increasingly smaller audience, but I think that is kind of the nature of like a, a true sort of marketplace of ideas um, where it, the marketplace of ideas is not that every idea has to be forced on you, um, but that, that different systems can choose who they want to listen to and who they don't want to listen to. And so I, it struck me as that is a, a much better approach to, to thinking about sort of issues around content moderation and, and how it all works. Um, and I think that also in, in terms of getting back to the copyright context, that it does open up some really interesting opportunities there as well. Because again, you know, as, as I noted earlier, you know, a, a lot of the power of content creators today is to get their voice out there and to get it heard and to to find the people who support you and your fans and and um and to figure out the best way to communicate with them and a system like this opens up new possibilities for for new innovations in terms of how people share their content how they communicate with fans how they can connect with them how they can build community um and and Building that at a protocol level allows for a lot more innovation and a lot more new things to occur rather than having to rely on just a few small platforms that that effectively get to determine the, the terms of any deal. It's a really interesting um, essay, and I'd encourage people to go and have a, a read of it. And um, you also touch on some of the the objections that might be made to, to such sure. a system too, which is interesting. Um, I must say, when I was reading it, it it started me thinking about the recent discussion or the approval of the Digital Services Act in the EU, which actually has a a requirement that uh, for data portability between platforms. And I was thinking, well, bingo, there you go. If I can just, if it's all simple, if it's all, um, I can zip it up in a package like my email (laughs) into a file, you know, download it and then shift it somewhere else. Um, a lot of us, I think, would be quite ready to do that between platforms that might offer more than what the current platforms operate. So yeah. I was just thinking maybe something to to consider in the context of how that could be implemented. 
Yeah, I, I think I, I, I'll push back a little bit. I, I do think that, that some of the, the thinking on the, the DSA is is moving in the right direction. I don't think I agree with it entirely. I think there, there are a yeah. lot of problems I have with, with the mm-hmm. DSA approach. And, and in particular, like there, there is a slight difference between interoperability and portability. Um, and those often get lumped together. And I think that the DSA approach is more about portability um, and and which to some extent already exists with the major platforms. All of them have, you know, and, and they have this agreement. I forget what it's called. I'm blanking on the exact name, but they have this this sort of agreement that that all of their data is is portable, that you can pull your data out of Twitter. You can pull your data out of Facebook. You can pull your data out of Google. Um, you know, the problem is you can't really do that much with it once you have yeah, it. Once it's, the out, other platforms once it's are, out, where does it go then? You know, right. <laughs> And so, so you know, the bigger issue to me is really interoperability, yeah, yeah, which is this yeah. idea that you know that that you know different services can communicate with each other, and that that is a slightly different. It's they're connected and they're related, and there are some ways that you can get from one to the other. But I think the the focus on portability over interoperability doesn't doesn't get us as far as it could. Okay, well, that's that's kind of what I was thinking was maybe this is where they should be moving in the direction of thinking about how it might this could be done in a meaningful way as opposed to just giving yes. me a fat file that sits on my <laughs> desktop and I can't do anything with as opposed to being able to move it to someplace else that preserves my photographs and my investment in time and relationships that I have on a, on a given platform. Um, yeah. I, I also wanted to touch on, um, as, as we're reaching the end of our time here, but I'd love to touch on the fraught issue of NFTs, non-fungible tokens, no. which have certainly become a topic du jour and certainly of a degree of obsession on the one hand, especially right now at, at this moment when everything seems to be crashing on the um, crypto side and yeah. some derision on the other. Um, you've just successfully funded an NFT project, an essay project, which I think is cleverly entitled yeah. Newly Finite themes and a, a, a different <laughs> NFT. Um, and what's that about? And how does it fit into some of the economics and copyright and open internet themes we've been talking about? Because I talked in an earlier podcast, I, I spoke briefly about this with the lawyer, Lawrence Lessig, and, um, and he was mm-hmm. talking about wh- how he saw NFTs as a positive for um, creators and for uh, and in a way, in a way that got me rethinking about an issue that often is seen just as either we're mad about this and we want to buy our board ape, or this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. So, <laughs> so um, clarify yeah. what you're doing and and how it might fit in, and how does it benefit um, creators? Yeah, no, it, it, it's a really important point, and and I should note, you know, up front, like I think a, a, an awful lot of the NFT space is is garbage, and and scams, and and just downright nonsense. Um, and I think that that is really important, and I think unfortunately that's clouded out a lot of the like more interesting discussion mm-hmm. about where and how is this interesting. Um, and, and to me, and, and I'd wrote this in the in the the intro to that the essay, and I'm still working on the the larger paper the newly finite themes paper. Um, I don't have a delivery date yet. It's, it's, it's turning into a big project. Um, but, uh, um, you know, it ties back to that original series that I wrote about, about scarcity and abundance in, in a lot of ways, because as I, as I was talking about, you know, there's this really interesting space where as you have new abundances, you're creating new scarcities and, and the, the business model challenge is finding those new scarcities. And the, the thing that struck me is interesting about NFTs my original assumption, and is is pretty clear in what I had originally written, was that you know anything digital is automatically abundant or infinite, an infinite good, and should not be considered scarce. And and kind of thinking of digital digital goods as scarce never made sense. Was my original thinking. The NFT phenomenon started to make me rethink that because it created this way in which you could have scarce digital goods. And and I am generally against the idea of artificial scarcity, um, because I, you know, which is often what, what, what copyright is about. And, and so, um, I, you know, 
artificial scarcity where it doesn't make sense tends to, to lead to all these other kinds of problems that I've talked about. Um, but the interesting thing about the NFT space to me was not so much the idea of like owning a digital file, because I think that's garbage. And obviously anyone can copy a digital file. Uh, and so there's, there's no, there's no real ownership of the digital file, but rather you've created a different kind of scarcity, which is sort of a scarcity of provenance, right? Uh, it's a scarcity of who has, this right. And and I've referred to it as sort of digital hipsterism. You know, it's basically like, you know, proving, <laughs> but it's, but it's so accurate when, when you think about it, right? Because it's effectively saying like, I was here first. I, I supported this first and I have a way to display that. And that itself is kind of a, a scarce value. Um, and it's, it's almost this sort of scarcity of being in a club, scarcity of being a member and being able to prove that you are a member of this club. Um, and that's a really, really interesting space to explore. And, and I'm not sure where it comes out, but it is a different approach. Like it's tackling a lot of the same things that copyright is trying to tackle. Um, and, you know, and maybe, and there are certainly parts of the NFT space that are absolutely ridiculous and laughable. And I think deserve to collapse. Um, but like, I have trouble looking at NFTs and saying they're any crazier than copyright, right? There's so many things about copyright that are equally stupid and ridiculous. And the setup, you know, doesn't really help artists and is only designed to pretend to help artists. And that may be true of some aspects of the NFT space as well. But I think if, if we approach what NFT is allowing, what NFTs are allowing through, through a more thoughtful process and say like, you know, creating this ability to to be a member of a club, to 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 show my support, in the same way that Patreon was kind of interesting. I think there are some really interesting things to come out of it, and I'm kind of happy that that the NFT market right now feels like it's collapsing because you know you want that hype and nonsense and and craziness to go away, and you want mm -hmm. people to ignore it for a while, and you want people to say like, "Oh, that's all garbage," so that the actual like the people who are thinking about this stuff, not just the people just trying to drive dump, you know you know, quickly jump in and get rich, let them go away and then let people think through, like, how can we use this to actually support artists in creative and clever ways that make sense for everybody and that align the incentives much better. And so that, that's sort of where my interest in the NFT space comes from. And, and I, 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 like, I know many others will be looking forward to, to reading that essay when it's completed and out. And, um, I'd, also encourage people to go to the Tech Dirt site and check out those posts on the SOPA anniversary and especially Mike's post, um, which concludes with looking ahead in some positive ways towards what might be coming. Um, that might be, a, that's a nice bookend, I think, for the um, for this discussion here and also to get a, get a, a, a positive look ahead as well. Um, so for anyone who wants to learn more about what we've discussed, uh, start, of course, with a visit to Tech Dirt, where I can promise you, if you search for topics of interest and begin reading, you are going to quickly vanish down an informative rabbit hole of related <laughs> post suggestions, and you'll probably be up till two in the morning like I was last night. Um, you can also find Mike's influential Knight Foundation essay on knightcolumbia.org. That's K-N-I-G-H-T-C-O-L. UMBIA.org in its free speech futures essay section, or you can just search the internet for its title, Protocols Not Platforms. And um, I want to thank Mike for um, so much for talking to me on the Wald Culture podcast here today, and to our listeners and viewers. Thanks for joining us. And for now, it's goodbye from me, Carla Millington, and the Wall of the Culture podcast. We hope you'll explore some of our previous podcasts, which are all waiting for you at waldculture.org. And we'll join us for some future episodes as we explore the spaces where technology, culture, and copyright collide. Goodbye. Goodbye.